persistent homology, which we saw last week, is the study of filtrations. Uh, and the pipeline for it roughly looks something like this. We start with a filtration uh, simplicial complex. We produce um, persistence modules by taking the kth homology of these uh, sub uh, subcomplexes, and then uh, doing a lot of hard work, we produce barcodes. Now, um, the algorithm which did all this, we saw a sort of equivalent uh, equivalent way of thinking of a filtration, which is just a monotone map. Monotone meaning order preserving map. B from uh, uh, from k to the real numbers. So k is the uh, simplicial complex that you're filtering. Um, so you may as well uh, associate to each simplex the, the smallest t for which it lies in the simplicial complex uh, ft. Um, and now this equivalent perspective, persistence modules become uh, homology groups of fibers. Uh, what I mean by that is we're looking at HK of the set of simplices sigma satisfying uh, B of sigma less than or equal to T. Uh, and then you're changing T, uh, making it larger and larger so that there are inclusion maps. And then, uh, so, so those are exactly the same persistence modules. And of course, you'd get the same barcodes. It's just a different uh, perspective on the top row of this diagram. Today, I want to talk about um, something strictly more general than this perspective. So we're just going to look at simplicial maps. Um, let's say F from K to L. So what we have done is we've taken the target space, which used to be R plus, and upgraded it to be a much more necessary, much more complicated, potentially, uh, space. Um, L could be uh, some triangulation of Rn. It could be, so, so that would be assigning, instead of a single number to every simplex and looking at the filtration, you could be looking at a vector assignment and then looking at various filtrations associated to the vector assignments. Or if you had angular measurements, you'd assign um, L could be something like a product of circles. If you had two uh, angular measurements, then, then you're living on a torus, for instance. So, uh, so these are different ways of measuring things on simplicial complexes. So we're just going to abstract that out a little bit and think of an arbitrary simplicial map. And then the question is, um, what goes here? And the answer to that is sheaves. So that is why uh, this week is focused on sheaves. Um, and so let's get to the definition of a sheaf right away. And by the end of this lecture, I will explain what sheaves have to do with fibers, so homology groups of fibers of simplicial maps, whatever that means. So uh, here's the definition. A sheaf on L, so L is the simplicial complex that was a target space for F, um, is a functor, we'll call it S for sheaf, going from something to something else. Uh, and so let's define what the domain and the codomain are. So this L with the less than uh, should be thought of as the simplicial complex L itself, but treated as a poset. So the partially ordered set of simplices in L. And of course, the partial order is coming from the face relation. So sigma less than tau and so on. Um, and the target category is, of course, uh, vector spaces and linear maps over the field F, uh, which I guess I haven't mentioned the field F before and I don't plan on mentioning it again. So this is just a functor from uh, the poset of simplices in a given simplicial complex to the uh, category of vector spaces. Um, any such definition, uh, which is nice and short, um, you, you tend to find, well, okay, so if it's nice and short and it covers, uh, if it's talking about a deep concept, you'll find a couple of words that are doing a lot of heavy lifting. And in this definition, the word functor is doing all the work. So um, we should unwrap this definition and see what it really is uh, doing. Uh, so note, um, 
unzipping this definition, here's what we get. S assigns um, to each simplex a vector space, which is S sigma. Uh, this is called the stock of S over sigma. Um, in fact, you know what? We will write simplices of L as tau, so we may as well get used to that now. So all the sigmas are really taus. Okay, so each simplex in sigma gets its own vector space, and there is absolutely no rigid constraint in what the dimension of that vector space has to be. So different simplices could get different dimensional vector spaces, and that's perfectly fine for a sheaf. And then to each face relation, tau less than tau prime, a linear map, uh, which has to go from uh, the stock of the source to the stock of the target. Uh, and we call this linear map um, st less than uh, tau less than tau prime. So that's, the, that's the arrow. And this is um, uh, called the restriction map. Okay, and again, if this is all that uh, that your uh, sheaf was doing, then it would be an extremely boring object. The fact that there's a functor, uh, that, that these assignments have to be functorial, means that there are two additional axioms that have to be satisfied. Um, and so there's, a, there's an easy one, uh, the identity axiom, and then there's a sort of serious one, the associativity axiom. And let's see what these two axioms are saying. So the identity axiom is simply saying for every tau in L, the restriction map uh, that sends uh, S tau to itself, the stock to itself. So the restriction map corresponding to the identity in the poset, which just says tau less than equal to tau, um, is the identity. So our functor has to send identity maps in the poset to identity maps in the category of vector spaces. That one's easy, uh, at least to state, and it's not very difficult to sort of satisfy this requirement. Um, the associativity axiom is much more serious. It's imposing very, very um, strong constraints. Um, here it is. So uh, for all tau less than tau prime less than tau double prime in L, uh, you have the obvious restriction map. So that arrow that I've just drawn is a restriction map uh, for tau less than tau prime. Uh, then there's one for tau prime less than tau double prime. And then there's the direct one, tau less than tau double prime. So homework, fill out, uh, label those three arrows accurately. This diagram commutes across any such triple. So, um, okay, so that's what uh, the that's all the heavy lifting that the word functor was doing in the previous definition. So uh, saying a sheaf is a functor of this type is completely equivalent to um, saying that it assigns a vector space to every simplex, a linear map to every face relation, and satisfy these two axioms. So um, let's see a few examples of sheaves. Uh, there's the zero sheaf which we can write as uh, zero sub L. So uh, assigns uh, the zero vector space to every tau. And if it assigns a zero vector space to every tau, I don't have to tell you anything about the restriction maps because the sources and targets of all those restriction maps are zero, therefore those maps have to be zero. Um, for um, a fixed simplex tau in L, the skyscraper sheaf uh, which I'll write sky tau sk tau on L uh, sends every simplex that's not equal to tau to zero to the zero vector space. With, uh, uh, with tau itself being sent to the one-dimensional vector space. 
Uh, and again, this fixes all the restriction maps because uh, the only restriction map that can possibly be non-trivial is the one from tau to itself, which has to be the identity. All other maps have either their domain or their codomain zero, so all the other maps have to be zero. Okay, and the constant sheaf, which is the final example, uh, I'll just write it as F L uh, assigns F to every simplex um, and the identity from F to F to every face relation. So these are three examples of sheaves roughly getting more complicated. There's more and more information as you go from A to B to C in terms of having non-trivial uh, uh, stocks. So um, the point I want to make uh, regarding the definition before we, uh, before we see what this definition is good for in terms of fibers of simplicial maps uh, is that the associativity condition is serious. So the associativity axiom imposes serious constraints. Um, if you just start sprinkling vector spaces and linear maps on simplices and face relations, most likely you will not get a sheaf. Um, so if L is uh, the solid two simplex, then any sheaf S on L has the form uh, so you, you assign a vector space to every vertex and edge. So there will be um, x, sorry, one, two, this should just be two. And so this edge is zero, two. And in the middle, you have s, zero, one, two. Uh, so, uh, and the restriction maps all go from small simplices to large ones. Uh, that have you know, face relation with them, so it looks something like this. So there are seven vector spaces and one, two, three, four, five, I can't count, but as many blue arrows as you have worth of linear maps. And what the associativity condition is saying is that these three paths, so pick any vertex, so S0, for example, is a perfectly good vertex. There are three paths of, um, I guess I didn't draw that one, it's there. Uh, so there are three paths to uh, S012, and each of them is representing a linear map, you know, composing in, the, in two of the cases, but directly going from S0 to S012 in the last case. Um, and these have to be equal. So that's a, that's a strong requirement in the matrices that you're allowed to place, um, because in general, these things will not commute. So you have to do some special work uh, to get a sheaf, uh, even over the two simplex. Um, the reason the, the constant sheaf and the zero sheaf, uh, you don't have to check these things is, of course, because the identity and the zero map commute with everything inside. Okay, so let me tell you now why, uh, what on earth sheaves have to do with fibers of simplicial maps. Uh, so let F K to L be a simplicial map. And recall that the fiber of F over every tau in L is defined by uh, so it's a set of all sigma in K whose F images are faces of tau. Uh, so this is just an aside, it's not really part of the proposition. I just wanted you to remember what the fibers are. Uh, then the assignments uh, sending every tau to the kth homology of its fiber and every face relation to the map induced on homology by the inclusion of these fibers. constitute a sheaf over L. So 
uh, by constitute a sheaf, I mean they satisfy the identity and the um, uh, associativity axioms. Uh, you can see already that you do have a, a this vector space H K uh, tau over F assigned to every simplex tau, and every uh, linear map gets uh, sorry every uh, face relation gets a linear map coming from the fact that fibers over tau uh, will include into fibers over tau prime one over tau as a face of tau prime. That's a consequence of the definition. So um, this automatically satisfies the identity and associativity axioms. And the proof is, um, is, is a one-liner, is that homology is a functor. And uh, this inclusion of subcomplexes commutes for every tau, tau prime, tau double prime ascending sequence. So when you apply the k homology functor uh, to each of these three, then you'll get something commuting, and therefore the strict associativity axiom is automatically satisfied when you take the k homology of the fiber. So these fibers are sort of now uh, living over simplices. Uh, instead of living over real numbers as they were for persistence modules, but roughly we have the same structure. Um, so in the next lecture, now that we know how to build uh, sheaves from fibers, we will see what we can do with sheaves. See you there.